great to be with you, really is. And uh, 20 years since I was here last time, and it was the time when you brought two congregations together. Uh, Paul Weaver, Assemblies of God, and myself were here together. Great to be with you, great to meet Dan and Marie. I'd never met them before. I looked down, people I do know. John Parry, Mike, it's made my day seeing John. I was a pastor in West Bromwich about, I don't know, the end of the 70s. And uh, he was in the church there. And it's great to see you, John, today and all of you. You know, such a great welcome. Thanks for the welcome earlier on. I mean, five minutes with Tony. I think I've known him all my life. <laughs> Amazing. Really great to meet you, Tony, today as well. Now, what, uh, it's, oh, yeah, just let mention here that there are uh, some books. I think you've heard about this already, haven't you? Have you been told that when people buy it, they can't put it down? And the, <laughs> the reason is that I put super glue in the binding, and it helps a little bit. Uh, those are the back casual card at the end. It's a Christian novel, a thriller. I've got the gospel right the way through it. Most Christians buy it for themselves, but they do also buy it for um, friends and family who are not yet Christians, not ready to come to church, but are willing to read that. So I hope you have a look at that before you leave. Now, at the beginning of a new year, we're still at the beginning of a new year, aren't we? People wishes health and happiness for 2024. Um, uh, I keep good health for my age. I keep good health. But occasionally, you know, like all of us, we always get a bit unwell. And I had an illness that uh, strange sim symptoms and all that kind of thing. The doctor said one thing. He gave a, a fancy name to it. Physiotherapist said other things. And in the end, I went online and Googled. Now, you shouldn't really Google in the middle of the night, should you? Have you ever done that? Because if I Google in the middle of the night, I think I'm going to die by breakfast time. <laughs> always. It always happens like that. But this was a good thing. They said, well, it may be, uh, it says on there, with all your symptoms, that you may have a vitamin deficiency of, they named the vitamins. So I thought, well, on Amazon, bought these vitamins, and absolutely incredible. That's all it was. A need for vitamins. All the symptoms, virtually all the symptoms went away, and it was a matter of vitamins. I want to speak this morning about how in 2024 to live healthy as a believer. Someone say amen. You're up for that. How to live healthy. And we're going to look at some vitamins. And I don't know how many we'll do um, right now, but we're certainly going to be looking today. I know what time you finish, and I've looked at my notes, and I think I should be finished by Tuesday. <laughs> no, no, I know what time you finish. And we're going to be looking at the most important uh, vitamin first, and then after that, we'll just see how we go, just see how time is. Are you ready for the Word of God this morning? Well, I love the atmosphere, the presence of God. Amen. Great being here today. Really, really, you know, I'm, you say, well, you're preaching a different church every week, John. You say that everywhere. I don't say it everywhere. There's a lovely sense of the presence of God in our worship. Well, let's start with this one, vitamin A. Someone say vitamin A. Acceptance. Acceptance. You know, one of the most important things, when you and I became a Christian, the first thing that we should have experienced was a sense that though we were separate from God, we're now uh, united with him. We were far off, now we've come close. We were outside God's family, now we're in God's family. And uh, that was, when a baby's born, the first positive emotion that a baby feels, initially it cries, doesn't it, and there's fear, new environment, where am I? But the first positive thing that a baby feels is acceptance. Now that cuddle. Some of us this morning, and I, I'm not going to bring people out for words of knowledge and stuff, and this is not spiritual gifts. This is the law of averages. Congregation of this size, there will be those who believe God has accepted them. They feel accepted by their brothers and sisters, but deep down, and God's forgiven them, but they don't forgive themselves. And that acceptance that we have in Jesus, it's like the cuddle of God. It's like the baby being taken to the mother and the mother saying, you, are, you were part of me. Now you're separate from me, but you're part of me. You need the embrace of God. The Bible says, and this is a great verse, round about us and underneath us are the everlasting arms of God. You know that verse? And that's, do you know, think about that. You know, when I meet people, that I'm sitting, John, for example, just earlier on, give him a hug. Great to see you, John, after all these times. Well, we do that. We hug one another as adults. The only time that round, arms are round about us and underneath us is when we're held as a baby. And that's how God wants to cradle us in a sense of acceptance. The Bible says in the, in the uh, King James Version, in Ephesians 1, we are accepted in the beloved. Bit of a strange phrase. This is what it says in the NIV. 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us. Someone say chose us. You see, it wasn't a haphazard thing. I'm, I'm assuming that you're a Christian. Maybe those here yet haven't had that sense of being accepted by God or they haven't accepted Christ as their Savior. But let's speak a moment to those who are saved, those who are Christians. This, this sense of we have been, it says we've been chosen in him. Chosen. Wow. It's not a haphazard thing. I happened to be at church or a non-Christian friend happened to tell me about the Lord or someone gave me a Christian novel and I found out how to become a Christian. Not that. It is we were chosen in him. Before, wait for this, before the creation of the world. Now you thought, well, I became a Christian. You can give me the date. You can tell me the time almost probably. So he said, that was it. That day in whatever. In my case, I did it when I was a little boy in my grandfather's an evangelist and I was in a big tent crusade and I raised my hand. I knew I was saved that day. You say, how's that possible? Believe me, I knew it. I absolutely knew I was saved at that moment. But it wasn't even because there was a preacher or the preacher was a relative. It is because God had chosen, chosen us, chosen us. God says to Jeremiah an amazing thing. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 he felt absolutely unworthy. He said, Lord, why have you put me in a leadership position? I am useless. In fact, although I'm in my 40s, I actually feel like a child. Do you know what God said to him? Before you, now this is mind-blowing. I can't understand it, but the Bible is true. Before you were in the womb, I knew you. Wow. Wow. Not when you became a Christian. Oh, that's you. Oh, you're part of my family now. No. Not when you became a Christian. Before you were in the womb, I knew you. And when you were born, I set you apart for purpose. What a sense of acceptance he must have felt. You know, what a sense of belonging must have been in his spirit. Uh, absolutely. God, we're not tolerated. Amen? We've all got failures. That preacher has. We've all got failings, but we're not tolerated by God. We've been chosen. We're accepted. You know, in the congregation that side, there will be those who say, I just don't feel. I don't feel accepted. I believe in God. I believe even I'm saved, but I really don't feel the embrace of God over my life. I want to say, by the time we finish, in a few minutes' time, I'm praying that you're going to feel the acceptance of God over your life. Amen? Absolutely belong. Now I belong to Jesus, the old song says. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Chosen, even though we're unworthy. He said, I was in West Brom, and a couple of houses we've lived in. I've been a pastor 52 years, and a couple of houses we've lived in, sadly, we've been burgled. And uh, we were burgled once in West Brom, and uh, we were burgled in when I lived in Scotland. I was leaving in Scotland. And on the Scottish one, uh, I was away preaching somewhere, and my wife had been for a meal with friends because these friends knew I'd be away for a while. And she got home from the friends and she disturbed the burglars. And all our stuff, you know, like TV and in those days, remember video recorders? In the middle of the floor, ready for them to take off. Well, my wife must have disturbed them that they got off. Let's imagine that I come in and I caught the guy. Let's say he's 18 years of age. I catch the guy with my video or my TV in his hand um, if I'd have said, right, got hold of your son now, this is not, you know, not robbing my stuff, I'd phone, phone the police, got him in one hand, got the phone in the other, phone the police, and the police come and take him away. That's called justice, isn't it? What if he said to me, he said, I'm sorry, sir, I'm, you've caught me. I admit that I was doing your house over. I admit that, but I've got issues in my life, and, you know, I, I come from a, um, you know, a, a, I'm on my own. My mom's on her own. And I've never done this before. And I'll never do it again. And I say, well, you know, I believe you. You know, I believe you. What I'm going to do, put that stuff down now and go off now and we'll forget it. Now, that's not justice, is it? That's mercy. I've shown us mercy. God help us if God gives us justice, friends. Because we got what we deserve. We'll be in hell, all of us. That's mercy. But then he says to me, you know, I'm really sorry, I'm not going to do this again. I say, all right, okay. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with you. My wife and I don't have any kids, and uh, you're going to say this is ridiculous, this will never happen. My wife don't have any kids. Uh, when we die, we've got nobody to leave anybody, anything, our money to. 
So what we're going to do is this. I am going to say to you, you're on your own. Um, perhaps his mother's died, father's died, he's on his own. I'm going to adopt you into my family. I'm going to give you my name. And everything I own will belong to you. He said, John, nobody in the world would do that. Jesus did that for every one of you. That's called grace. See, justice is getting what I deserve. Mercy is not getting what I deserve. But grace is getting what I don't deserve. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, caught with the TV in our hand, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and he brings us into his family. He adopts us into his family. That's why we're called Christians, because we've got the name of Christ. And the Bible says, listen, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Adopted, chosen. Do you feel accepted this morning? Do you feel accepted this morning? That's what God promises for us. He adopts us. This is what the, this is what the um, message says. Long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. And what a pleasure he took in planning this. And this thing about being separated, and now later on in, in the same chapter, it says this. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation. Look at that. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself. As the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And him, you two are being built together. Built together. You see, acceptance is important, but also alignment is important. Going back to when I was in West Brom, uh, we bought, we had this little house in uh, West Bromwich. We bought one week, uh, and a uh, very small house, very small house. Can't imagine how. You know, if you swung a cat, the cat would die. I mean, that's how small it was. And um, eventually we get to the place where uh, I'm out preaching somewhere as a, as a young minister in those days, and out preaching a friend of mine's church. And uh, he used to be a carpenter before he became a Christian. And when I got to his house, I was staying at his house, Burton on Trent, I think it was. And uh, he said, his wife says, have you seen what Cameron's done in the kitchen? So I look at the kitchen. I can't believe it. Beautiful kitchen. None, none of us were on any money in those days. I thought, why do you get a kitchen like this? He said, well, I used to be a carpenter. I did it myself. And I thought, you know, I haven't got any do, do I haven't, I haven't got any do-it-yourself skills whatsoever. And so I said to Cameron, how do I start? I'm a young man, not being married long. How do I start doing it yourself? He said, well, John, the thing to do is get the Reader's Digest book and do it yourself. Anybody old enough to remember that big, thick volume? Cost like a week's wage to me. Unbelievable. I mean, this book here, this Bible is thick. This was about twice the size of this. Plumbing, um, carpentry, wallpapering, everything. So I buy this book, and announce to Marilyn, Marilyn, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a do-it-yourself project. She said, John, you've never done anything in your life. What are you going to do? A spice rack, something like that. No, I'm putting, wait for this, fitted wardrobes in the spare bedroom. Never hung a picture in my life. Fitted Warbrook, she said, John, start with a spice rack. Start with something small. You know, it's going to be, no, I'm a pastor. Pastors think they know everything, don't they? Yeah. Big mistake. So anyway, here I go. I get the tools. I buy the tools. I haven't got any tools. I buy the tools. I buy the wood. And uh, I put this split spare room. like a, there's only just two bedrooms. And that we were in one. And this was almost like a storage room. But I thought, oh, this is where I put, I put what's fitted wardrobes in. Put the shelves in, got it all done, really proud. Then, big glass mirrors. You remember big glass mirrors? You know, the wards of a wardrobe. Got two of those, bought two of those. I thought, this is amazing. And my wife says, spice racks, what an insult. And look at this word, eighth wonder of the world, this. And I put the, wind, the mirrors in to slide into place. Not only did they not slide, they didn't even grate. They did not even move on the rails. You know what? Because I had missed out one major tool, the cheapest of them all. Do you know what it was? A plumb line. I'd assumed that because the house was modern, then the walls would be true. Do not believe that because something is modern, the walls will be true. Modern does not mean true. Cool does not mean true. Nothing wrong with modern and cool. But we have to align. Someone say align. This vitamin vital... Being aligned, 
Acceptance is important. I'm going to come back to acceptance in a minute. But alignment is, put, is, is important. If I had taken the plumb line, piece of string with a bit of thing at the end, put it down, I'd realize it's hanging here. It should be hanging there. That's why it didn't work. It's end to the story. And uh, eventually, I just left the mirrors in the spare room on, on you know, the big mirrored doors. I couldn't do anything with them. I'd have to rip the whole thing out and start again. So I left it there. And uh, eventually, I was about to move to another church from West Bromwich, Cheltenham. And a young couple who just got married in our church said, Pastor, this was like your first house. We're getting married. If, is it possible you might sell it to us? So I said, well, if you like, you can come around and see. He comes around. I show him around. It didn't take long to show him around. It's a small house. And uh, I showed him around. And I thought, oh, I've got to show him the spare room now. I've got to show him the wardrobe with, the, with mirrors on, the, the doors on, the bad stuck on the side. So I said to him, I said, listen, and I told him the story I told you told him the story I've told you. And uh, I said, now, look, you and your wife, you go, you go around and look on your own and come back and tell us at the end what you want to do. And so he says, yeah, we want to buy it. So I said, I better say this. Just to say to you, if I ever visit you in the future and, you know, I go into the spare room and I see you've ripped it all out, I will not be offended because it's not the greatest bit of work I've ever done. He said, we've talked about it already, Pastor. He said, I said, love you. He said, we're going to keep it. I said, I'm sure they know. What a lovely thing to say. He's going to keep it. He says, yeah. He said, we've heard the first few years of marriage can be difficult. And if we ever hit, hit a problem, we can always go in the spare room and have a laugh. <laughs> People can be cruel, can't they? Dan, people can be cruel. <laughs> but you see, alignment. You cannot build in 2024 unless we're aligned with the Word of God, not with what everybody on Facebook believes. I'm on Facebook. But not with what popular opinion says. Young people, not what everybody at school or university says. Not what everybody thinks. It is what is God saying, I align myself with that. The Bible says when we're building in God, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Apostles and prophets, that means the spiritual leaders in the church who give input as well, obviously. But they have to be aligned. They have to be aligned with, with Jesus. Don't follow, and I'll say it, Dan, me, anybody, don't follow elders, Peter, Peter. We don't follow leaders. We follow leaders who align to Christ. Paul says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Jesus Christ. So alignment, acceptance is very, very important. We see what happens is this. When you're dealing with the things of God, that which is vertical has to meet with that which is horizontal. What do I mean? Think of the cross. We got a cr No, we haven't got a cross here, but you know what I mean, a cross. You haven't got a cross. Absolutely brilliant. There we are. So you've got your vertical and your horizontal. Jesus says it's no good saying you love God who you can't see if you don't love your brother horizontal who you can see. Always in the spiritual life, our vertical and our horizontal must meet. That means it is not just important for me to grow in God and you and I to grow in God in this coming year because we are aligned to God. We need to be aligned to one another. It's not just that we live with God's acceptance of us. We need to be accepted with one another. And if we're not accepting one another, because we're all different. Aren't we all different? We're all different. <coughs> now the Bible says this. And I, I think I am going to only do one vitamin today. If I ever come back, I'll do some more. But, you know, it's up to you. We're going to just do vitamin A today. Because there's something important. See, there's a great disadvantage in being a visiting speaker. Most of you have not seen me in 20 years. I mean, and you probably wouldn't have remembered when I was here 20 years ago. The disadvantage is I'm getting up, who's this bloke, you know, what's he, where's he from, who is he, and all that kind of thing. And after a while, we, you start to accept me when I'm preaching. So it's an advantage. So it's an but there's a great advantage in being, that's a disadvantage, there's a great advantage in being a visiting speaker. Do you know what it is? It's the very same thing. I don't know you. If you fell out with one another and if you're fighting one another, I haven't got a clue. So when I say something that touches your spirit, it's not me speaking out of knowledge, it's God speaking into your heart. You following me? See, we preachers, we must never forget this, we preachers, you know what we are basically? We are postmen. 
We are postmen. My postman, I do, I know my postman. He, I would almost say he's a friend almost. I mean, we, we've lived in the same house for now for 20 odd years. My postman delivers every single letter I receive and has never written one to me himself. Because his value is not in writing letters, it's in faithfully delivering letters. Amen. And we preachers, we're only of any value, not if I get up and speak and say, you know, th these are the things that John Glass believes that we should, we're not interested. I need to have heard from God, got a word from God, and delivered it faithfully to you. Amen. Without changing it. Many preachers will change it to make it acceptable. You follow me? We don't change it. So if my, my postman is delivering an electricity bill, which should be 200 pounds, and it falls open by being stuck on his side of the door, and it says 200 pounds, he picks it up and says, I like John O'Malley, and he always gives a nice kick tip at Christmas. He takes a pen out and he strikes out a note and now I'm paying 20 pound. Is he a good postman or a bad postman? He's a bad postman because it's not for him to interfere with the word that has been sent. Are you following me? So if I say something that strikes home, you say, he's having a go at me. Of course I'm not having a go at you. I don't know you. But the Holy Spirit might be encouraging you. And one of those things we need encouragement is acceptance of one another. Now that's what the Bible says. He who is a member of Christ, a member accepted, has been clothed with Christ. Clothed with Christ. Now, how on earth, what, how do you get clothed with Christ? You know, we put a jacket on, a, a jumper to come to church. How do you clothe with Christ? Well, the Bible apparently makes it easier. In Galatians, it says this, Galatians 3.27, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. So, oh, I get it now. Well, no, I don't get it because it's even more complicated. Clothed with Christ means baptized into Christ. Let me do it. This is a baptismal term, isn't it? All right. Two people getting baptized next Sunday. One is a very wealthy woman. She has got all this bling. She's got all these jewels. She's a very intelligent woman. She's, she just spent 200 pounds on her hairdo. She's standing there. She's, when she gives a testimony, very articulate. The person next is a man who has got no education. In fact, he's homeless. He's got no money. He's got no savings. He hasn't got any. He's, I can hardly live. And they're both going to be baptized. Now, at this point of the baptismal tank, they're very different people. Isn't that right? The accent, the education, how the dress is very, very different. Once they step in here and go under the water, where's the hairdo? Where's the hairdo? Down here. There's only one thing that you notice about them now. They're wet. You only notice the element with which they are clothed in. You following me? And you and I, when we accept one another, we shouldn't be accepting one another on the basis of, you know, social status or whatever or race or anything like that. We should be accepting one another in the fact that when we see one another, we see a sister in Christ. A brother in Christ. Because that's, that's what it means to be clothed with Christ. Now, this has huge implications. It affects how the Father sees us because he doesn't see us as the sinners that we have been because he sees now clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. It affects how the devil sees us. It can only go so far with you because you're clothed with Christ. And it massively affects how we see one another. Now, I'm going to illustrate this in a way. Illustrate this in a way in a moment. And I want you to follow me. Now, don't get me wrong here. Pastor, somebody wants you. Pay him the £10 and give it him back. <laughs> have, you, have I got your attention? Come, are you looking at me? Thanks. Now, I'm not starting a new cult here, right? But I want you to touch my arm. I'm going to ask a few people to touch my arm. And I want the rest of you to just count how many people touch my arm, okay? Start with this lovely lady here. Hey, count in. Do you mind? That lovely. Uh, count in. How many? Shout it out. Nobody touch my arm. Peter, nobody touch my arm. They touch my clothes. 
That's very important. It's not me being clever. If you, sister, are clothed with Christ and someone offends you, if you're clothed with Christ, they offend Christ before they offend you. If you do a kindness to a brother or sister, before they receive your kindness, Jesus says, you've been kind to me. He said, John, I need Bible. That's a good illustration, but I need Bible, all right? What happens is Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I want to thank you. He says, thank you for what? When I was in prison, you visited me. We never, you were never in prison. When you were hungry, we fed you. I was never, you never given me any food. He says, well, you know, when you were sick, we visited you. He says, well, you never visited me. And then Jesus speaks to the poor and the dispossessed and the lonely. He said, you know, when you did it to them, you did it to me. See, that's why the Bible says when we take communion, we've got to be very careful how we treat one. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let a man examine himself and eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh, un I learnt it in the King James, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eats and drinks not understanding, discerning the body of Christ. You say, well, I want a verse for this business about these two people who are getting baptized, who rich, poor, doesn't matter. You know, it's an illustration, Pastor. But at the end of the day, where is it in the Bible? That getting baptized, it's a picture of death when you go under the water, isn't it? Death to an old life and risen to a new life. Let me read you the rest of what it says here in the scripture. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither, now look at this. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. That's the end of all racial discrimination. There is neither slave nor free. That is the end of all social separation between the rich and the poor, the powerful and the non-powerful. It's the end of it. You, there is neither male nor female. That's the end of all sexual discrimination. Because you're clothed in Christ. For you are all one. Someone say all one. All one in Christ Jesus. That's why it's important that we're not just accepted by God, but that we accept one another on this level, horizontally. Vertically accepted. Aligned to God, but aligned to one another. Let me just touch on one or two other vitamins without preaching. Vitamin B, believing. Oh, he said, my goodness me, that's simple. How long do you think we've been Christians, John? We understand about believing. We understand about faith. We understand about all of this. Believing on God. Someone says, you may be in today. I don't know. Remember, I'm a visitor. And you say, I'm a Christian because I believe in God. I believe. The Bible doesn't say believe in God. Why would it? The devil believes in God. And the devil's not a Christian. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. What's the difference? It's a preposition, in and on. I believe in parachutes. You follow me now, aren't you? I only believe on parachutes when I jump out of a plane at 10,000 feet and put my life in the hands of the parachute. So if you say you believe in God, you're not saved. But if you believe on God and you put your life in his hands, put it another way, that you have stepped out of the driving seat to the passenger seat and let him steer your future. That is the biggest vitamin B, B that we could imagine. Believing that God has got a plan for your life. Jeremiah, what's the plan for your life? This is a vitamin we need to take on board, isn't it? Before, remember I read it earlier, I'm going to read it again. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God says to Jeremiah, in chapter 1 and verse 5, in chapter 29 and verse 11, and I know every, I don't know, but I guess most of you know this verse, for I know the plans I have for you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and to give you a future. 
I think I'll just touch on the headline of this one as well as I finish. Vitamin D dedication. Need to be accepted by God, be accepting one another. If we don't, we offend Christ as well as the person. If we bless them, we're blessing Jesus as well as the person. Believing God's got a plan for your life. And then dedication, getting stuck in to God's purpose in our lives. You know, some of you have been here for many years. I've spoken to people who've been here for 20 years and more. I've spoken to other people who've been here 5 or 10 years before the meeting. Some of you have only recently come. What I want to say, if you're in a position of saying, well, I'll try this church and I'll try that church, or I'll try this church one Sunday and I'll come another, let me tell you, get your roots down. This is the word of God to you. Get your roots down in the house. This is my place. There was a song you were singing earlier on, I Love My Church. Now, first of all, I, first, I never heard it before, and I thought, well, that's not a very good song. You should be loving Jesus. But, you know, we should love our church as well. Joseph is a fruitful vine. Let me end with this text. Joseph is a fruitful vine, Genesis 49, 22, near a well whose branches run out over the wall. Vineyards, they cut the vines to the same height simply because they want, when people pick the grapes, to just be able to walk through them, pick them, pick them. If they're six foot high, they don't want them six foot high. It's too much trouble. It's not good. So all vines are the same height. Walls in vineyards are small walls because they're not there to stop people getting in. Nobody cares less if you take a grape and eat it. It's there to say, this is your property, this is my property. That's all it's there for. So all vines grow to the same level. The Bible says, Joseph, and I want to say this for you here in the, in the flame today. I'm praying this over your life, over the church, over you as an individual, over your family. Joseph was like a vine that didn't conform to the rest. Joseph is a fruitful vine whose branches go out over the wall. Why? Because it is the roots are in the well. The deeper our roots in God, the deeper our roots in commitment to the fellowship, the higher we will grow in 24 for God. Amen? Amen. Accepted, accepted, accepted by God. Last text is gone. Now, last illustration. So, I'm going to preach somewhere one day, a long time ago. This, and My car, I don't know, I've been in winter. It must have been all the slush of the road. And I thought, I can't turn up in a church with a, a car like this. It wasn't a Sunday, actually. It was a Saturday. I can't speak to this leadership thing, turning up in a filthy car like this. So I pull into the car wash, I've got time. So I pull into the, there's two people in front of me. And I pull in, and no problem, two people, won't take long. About four people come behind me, not a problem to me. I'm not going back, I'm going forward. I get in, and the first person in front of me is off. The second person is in the car wash, and he's going forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward. And it's going on forever. And I'm thinking to myself, how long are they going to be doing this? What are they doing? And I thought, I'll get out and have a word and see if I can help. But as soon as I get out, you know what's going to happen? The car wash is going to come on. So I thought, what am I going to do? Eventually, the guy gets out of his own car and he comes to me. And apparently, he'd been in one of those car washes that it starts as your front two wheels touch a pole and it starts the car wash. But this wasn't one of those. This was one, if you just put the money in the slot and waited, it would come on. So he gets out of his car, comes to me. He said, I'm sorry, sir. He said, I'm holding everybody up. I don't know how this works. So I, I tell him how it works. Oh, he said, I was going backwards and forwards, trying to get the car wash to work. He said, I'm sorry for holding you up. Wait for this. I'm only trying to get my car and myself in the right place. I thought, whatever I'm going to preach on at this place where I'm going, that's the best sermon you can get in. We can't cleanse ourselves. We need to get in a place where God will cleanse us. We can't anoint ourselves. We have to be in a place where God anoints us. Dedication. Get yourself aligned, plumb line. Receive a sense of acceptance. And get your roots down in God. Someone say that. Amen. Amen. I want to pray over you if I may. Let's all stand together. Let's all stand as we... I'm handing back to Pastor, and he'll do whatever he wants to do now as we close. I just want to pray blessing over you. Can I pray blessing over you? I can pray blessing over you. So I want to pray blessing over your life. 
And I wanted to get into a non-Pentecostal situation. We Pentecostals, we're very good at, how can I say, transmitting. We transmit our praise, our worship, our testimony. We can be loud when we need to be loud. It's all good. One of the things we're not brilliant at, and I say that having been a pastor a long time, and a Christian a long time, is we're not very good at receiving. We always want to be proclaiming. And sometimes we need to get in the world where we're not asking God for anything, we're not praising, we're not speaking in tongues. We're just receiving. Can you get in receiving mode right now? Can you, if, you, if you're comfortable with it, just raise your hand while I pray over you and bless, pray the blessing of God over you. Don't ask God for anything. Don't promise God anything. Just be in a receiving mode. And receive what God's got for you now. Father, thank you for this house. Thank you, Lord, for its history. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of people who've been through this church. Some have gone on to glory. Many will have gone on to glory. Many have been faithful and are still here now. Some are new to this place. Father, I pray this morning we'll feel every one of us with our hands raised before you. We'll feel the acceptance of God. We feel, Lord, that we are committed to you, but we're also committed in love one to another. Even though we're very different, we overlook the differences in one another and see that we're clothed with Christ. Father, we pray that we'll believe that you do have good plans for us in 24 as individuals. And Lord, we may not be worthy, but you're wonderfully worthy. And we receive all that you've got now. We receive it in Jesus' name. And Father, we, as we align ourselves with you, as we get ourselves in the right place this year, Father, we want to receive every one of the best blessings. We know the devil wants to spoil and mar and rob, but Father, you've only got good plans for us. Help us to align ourselves with you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Before you sit down and while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, can I say, I'm a, I'm a visitor today. There may be someone here and you say, Wow, I'd love to be accepted by God. Uh, I, th I thought, I, I believed in God, but I've just heard I've got to believe on God. I've got to trust myself to him as much as I trust myself to a parachute throughout my entire life. And I want to begin that journey to follow Jesus. I've never made that commitment before. Then while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and so I can pray for you. I won't bring you out to the front if you don't mind. I'll just pray for you from here. Just raise your hand where you are. When I see that hand, God bless you. I see you, my friend. Please put your hand down. I'll include you, young lady. God bless you there. Someone else here yeah, that I've missed. You know, it's just in my spirit. I just felt it was one or two more people that God was speaking to. So I'm going to wait a wee while, and then I'm going to pray for you collectively. Anybody else? Just raise your hand where you are. God bless you. See that hand there. Then, Father, we pray now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Let's give an applause to those who wanted to come into the family of God. See, for those of you who raise your hand, that was people accepting you. God has accepted you. That's people accepting you now. So, Father, we thank you for them. We pray as they begin their spiritual journey that, Father, you will just give them a great sense of belonging to you, belonging to your people, and a sense of the destiny you have for them in Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people said... Amen. Fabulous to be with you, Pastor.